Hey everybody and welcome to Bits of Board, where we're talking board games, miniatures, cards and dice. My name's Michael and today we are taking a look at Glenmore 2 Chronicles. This is the sequel to Glenmore which came out some time ago, a lovely little rondelle game where players would utilise that whole patchwork mechanics to get around the map, take tiles, build an engine, move your Scotsman, produce whiskey, all the good things in life. And they've come back with a new Kickstarter release that not only tightens up the game in some aspects, but it pretties it up like nothing else and throws not one, not two, not three mini expansions, but eight freaking mini expansions plus an extra Kickstarter exclusive one. Oh my goodness, the gameplay options indeed. Um, so today I want to take you through learning the base game. I want to show you through that and then we'll have a sneaky peek at uh, the Chronicle side of things to show what this game can be if you put in the effort and learn the Chronicles. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm very excited to show this one off because it is by far one of the best produced games I've seen all year. Wait till you see the tile size. Oh my goodness. All right, you ready? Let's get in. Here we are all set up for a two player game. We've got red and blue playing up against each other. And we've also got the very mysterious and random dice player as well, which helps fill out the player count. Now I'm gonna start off by taking you on a bit of a tour. We'll check out the main game boards and have a look at all the resources and what everything means. And then I'll take you through maybe a couple of rounds of gameplay to see it in action. Now, before we head off to the main boards, let's just take a quick look at our own playing space. This is the foundation of our home province. On the right hand section of the tile, we have our home castle. And on the left, we have a Scotsman producing tile. As a part of setup, we are going to begin with a single Scotsman in our castle. You'll also notice that there is a river running through the tile, and this is going to be super important when it comes down to the placement of other tiles, but we'll talk about that as we get into the game. For the moment, all you need to know is that we're going to be collecting tiles over the course of the game and adding them to our home region. Here we have the two main boards, the Rondel board on the left and the clan board on the right. Over here, we have all the resources that we'll need in the game, including our building resources, our whiskey, the scoring resources, coins for currency, and in the top right, we have our victory point markers. Below the board, I've placed our landmark cards, which will be awarded to players if they pick up a corresponding tile. Here you can see, if a player was to take Lock Locky into their home province, they would also take the Lock Locky province card, being awarded any bonuses printed at the base of the card. Now, a single game of Glenmore lasts for four rounds. Each round lasts until its corresponding stack of tiles has been depleted. So for example, as soon as we place the last A tile, the first round is over and we have some intermediate scoring. We then begin placing the B tiles and then once all of those are placed, we commence the second round scoring. Now I'll talk about the tiles and all that very shortly. But all you got to know for the meantime is that as soon as a tile is taken from the rondelle, a new one is added to the end of the track. Now, the D row over here will contain the world's end tile, and this is the game end trigger. This will make more sense very shortly, but as soon as all players have either landed on or passed the world's end tile, the game is over. In a normal game, this tile is placed somewhere in the middle of the deck, but in introductory games, it's recommended that the world's end tile is simply added to the top. Now, speaking of scoring phases, it's never too early to talk about how a player is to score points and essentially win the game. Here we have this nice little reminder track separating our tiles and the rondelle below. Just as a quick overview, points are awarded depending on the achievements of players. They will score points based on the number of Scotsmen on their home castle, and then the number of landmark cards, whiskey barrels, and person tiles they have in their collection. Points are awarded based on the difference between the first and last player in each of these categories. So it means to prevent players from skyrocketing in score, you do need to keep up across all areas. As I mentioned, this scoring will occur four times across the game after the A, B and C stacks of tiles have been removed. And then finally, after all players have either reached or passed the world's end tile. 
At this point, we do have some additional scoring to go through. Firstly, of course, coins are worth victory points traded in at one for one, which is pretty cool. Some landmark cards also award victory points. And then we have one of the most interesting scoring mechanisms of the game. Like the intermediate scoring, each player will compare their home territory size, the number of tiles making up their tableau. And this time, instead of the player with the most reaping the wards, they are penalized. And for every tile, a player has more than the player with the smallest territory will lose three victory points per tile they have in excess. At this point, the winner is then the player with the most victory points, with ties going down to the number of resources held in that player's territory. And of course, if there's still a tie, it's a shared victory. Aww. Now, the first of the two boards is the rondelle. This is the track around the marketplace where players will move picking up the tiles, adding them to their own personal tableau or their territory. These tiles represent developments, buildings, discoveries, and influential figures that will help develop their standing in the game. The makeup of a tile is fairly simple. In the top left, we may or may not have the initial cost for taking the tile into the tableau. In the bottom left, we have its immediate effects gained when placing the tile. And then in the bottom right, we have the effects gained when the tile itself is activated. Some tiles have an additional symbol, a wave printed in the top right hand corner, and this indicates that the tile should be placed as a part of the river. Now, more on that shortly, but it is very important to keep in mind, especially during placement of the tile. In the centre of the board, we have the marketplace, representing the goods that can be bought and sold at any given point of a player's turn. Each of the good types range in a cost from 1 to 3, with the player being able to purchase at the leftmost uncovered price. If a player wanted to purchase some barley, they would need to spend $1. When a good is purchased, the amount spent is placed covering the purchase price. Now, if someone needed to buy a barley, they would need to spend $2. The market is also used to sell goods obtained, and this works kind of the opposite way. If a space has one or more coins on it, the player may sell the good for the rightmost pile of coins. Reversing our example, if a player was to sell their barley, they would be able to take the $2 amount and the next person would be able to take the one. The second board is the clan board and this is where players will place their clan markers to show their standing with the different families in the game. These unlock special one-off rewards that players may utilize to support the development of their territory. All right, with the tour out of the way, we can take a look at the gameplay side of things. See, Glenmore is one of those special games where player turn order is not fixed. It's got the patchwork mechanism, although that's certainly not the first occurrence of that. The fundamentals of this mechanic date way back. Um, anyway, basically we have a run of player pieces and tiles skirting the rondelle. Over the course of the game, there is always going to be one blank tile space, and this is going to help us keep track of where the rondelle begins and ends. Basically, it ends with our player pieces, and the player whose piece is at the end of the track is the current player. To begin their turn, a player will take their Scotsman and place it on a tile in the rondelle which they would like to add to their province. They place their Scotsman on the tile they wish to keep, and then place the tile in a valid location in their province. Now there are a couple of placement rules. The tile must share an edge with an already placed tile, and that tile can never interrupt the river flowing through their home castle. Similarly, a player can only ever have one river in their home territory, so that means that this river tile here could not be added above it must be added to continue the river. The final thing to note is that a placed tile must be placed within range of one of a Scotsman in the province. Basically, that means the Scotsman in the home castle here allows the placement of a tile in any of its eight surrounding spaces, which means that this river tile could not be placed all the way on the left-hand side here. Now, when placing a tile, you may gain some immediate benefits. These would be present in the bottom left of the tile. Here you can see that Balachalish does not grant any immediate benefits, but its placement does enact a small chain of reactions starting from itself and spreading to the tiles surrounding it. Because down here in the bottom right, we have its activation bonus. Now this happens straight away after resolving any immediate effects, if present, with the player gaining the bonuses depicted. In this case, Balachalish grants one stone resource, which would be stored on the tile. 
After activating the newly placed tile, this effect spreads to all those adjacent to it, including diagonally adjacent. Now each of their activation bonuses fire off as well. In this case, we simply have two movement points, which we can use to mobilize the Scotsman present in our territory. We have two movement points here. We'll spend one of them to move our Scotsman over here, and that's about all we want to do. With our Scotsman occupying new ground, we would now be able to place in sections of our map that were previously unavailable. In this case, Arch Ferry would immediately grant us a Scotsman, and then two movement points which we could use to move them around. In this case, we'll move our Scotsman back home, and with that we have new options for expansion. Tiles granting resources will have those resources stored on the tile. But it's worth noting that a tile can hold at most three resources at any given time. And if you ever find yourself in this position, and it looks like you have the ability to produce a game, well, that's when you need to start selling to the marketplace. Now, it's worth noting that most of the game's resources must be stored on tiles in the player's home province. The exception to these are whiskey barrels, coins, and victory points. All the others must be stored on tiles. Now, some tiles, when activated, allow a player to trade goods for other goods. In this case, the required goods do not need to be present on the tile and can be taken from anywhere within the province or from the marketplace if the player can afford the purchase. Players won't always be trading for straight goods and in some cases may find themselves trading for victory points. This tile here allows the player to trade any combination of two cattle or sheep for four victory points. Finally, after taking and placing a tile, a new one is added to the rondelle from the current rounds stack. It is placed in the previously empty location, and then it's the next player's turn. Here, it would be the blue player. Let's say they move, they could take as many turns as they want, so long as they remain the last player in order. Now, in this case, we have the low player count dummy player here, the dice, but in any normal game, the blue player could continue moving forward, taking those tiles into their supply, really cashing in on the other player overextending. Let's reset and have just a quick look at some of the other purchase options. I mentioned before that we have people tiles. If a player were to take this tile, into their supply, instead of adding it to their home province, they simply create a pile nearby that will be scored in each of the scoring rounds. In this case, Martin Wallace grants a clan marker to be added to the clan board, which a player would place bearing in mind the cost of their effort. The first time a clan marker is placed, its cost is determined by the distance from the starting region over here. The player will trace a line along any of the roads in their journey to the family they wish to influence. And for every coin they pass in their journey, the cost of the action increases by one. So for example, in the first turn, the red player wants to influence Cameron. They trace a line from the start marker. One, two, no coins passed. This action is free. However, if they wanted to visit the Macintosh family, they would trace through Chisholm to Macintosh. This action would cost one coin. Now, after the first clan marker is placed, we unlock a new starting point for further journeys. Let's say the blue player wanted to visit Grant. Instead of tracing from the start line, they would instead trace directly from the red clan marker. This takes the cost from two all the way down to one. The final type of tile that can be purchased we've seen briefly before, and that is one of the named provinces. These tiles have associated cards that grant bonus rewards for their placement. They still have to be placed in the region just like any other territory tile, but the rewards are far greater. Here we have the three A cards, representing the three named A tiles that can come up in the first round of the game. The bonuses are pretty simple. Taking Lock Locky into a player's territory would grant two resources of any kind. Now resources we had a quick look at during setup, but we do need to define these resources. In this case, the symbols relate to non-scoring resources. That is the wood, the barley, the cattle, the stone, and the sheep, not the whiskey barrels. The second province, Don and Castle, allows the player to place one of their clan markers on the clan board. The third card is very simple, granting simply three coins. But as you saw, these can be used to purchase goods throughout the course of the game. Now, as the game continues, more tiles will enter the game. The further along you go, the more powerful the bonuses become. 
Here, gaining duo at castle, we get to place a clan marker and gain one coin. Taking lock shield, we get to place a Scotsman on the lock shield tile in our province. We also gain a whiskey barrel, which we'll place in our personal supply. Taking Inverness will grant a barley and a whiskey barrel. In round C, we only have two province tiles. Loch Ness, which allows you to activate additional tiles during your activation, and then Armadale Castle, which increases your in-game scoring for the coins you have in your supply. The final round of the game adds Loch Mora, which allows players to discard territory tiles from their province. We also have Castle of May, which allows the player to activate all tiles in their province instead of just those adjacent. And then we have Castle Moyle, which doubles the number of Scotsmen present in your home tile during endgame scoring. Now before we go too far, let's quickly talk about the dice here, because you're going to see it in action for our gameplay example later on. The dice is essentially a dummy player that is utilized in a two-player game and optionally utilized in a three-player game. It just fills out the player count and helps things move on by. Basically, if the dice is ever the last player in turn order, they will activate by rolling, and whatever the value shown on the roll result is how many spaces they will move. Here, the dice will cross two tiles, one and two, with whatever they land on being discarded from the game. Now, that is not the only way that tiles can be discarded from the game. Should all players, and in this case dice, ever pass an existing tile, that too is removed from the game. Remembering that even after a dice turn, we do need to refill that rondelle. All right, let's run through a couple of rounds, beginning with the red player. Having a look at the available tiles, we can see that the only tile that's gonna cost us anything is Pulteney down here, and that's gonna cost us one stone. But the stone is quite a fair way through the first run of cards, so let's not go too far there. Let's dive in and get the barley the first of the starter tiles. Red will place their tile to the north. There are no immediate benefits from placing the tile, but it does activate itself and the tiles surrounding it. So we're gonna grab a barley, place it on the tile, and then we gain two movement points because this tile activates everything surrounding it. We move our Scotsman and replenish a tile on the rondelle. Blue players go. Let's have the blue player play a little more aggressively than the red. They can see there's only two tiles out that are going to be able to produce stone. So they're going to rush for them to try and edge the red player out from some later purchases. They're going to go straight over to, I'm not even going to try pronouncing that one again. We'll place this one to the south of the river. Again, no immediate effects, but we do get its activation, gaining a stone and two movement points. Let's just leave things the way they are for the time being. We again replenish the track. And then before we head into the red player's activation, we have our dummy player. So we're going to go ahead and roll the dice. We get a one. And so our sheep producing tile is no more. Red's back in action. And I think they're going to go for cattle. We'll place the tile. No immediate benefits, but again, we do activate everything surrounding. One cow, another barley. We, of course, gain two extra movement points to move our little dude around, but I'm thinking let's keep him where he is for the time being. We replenish our track. Oh, and it looks like I forgot to replenish during our dummy player's turn, so we'll draw another one there. The dummy player gets another roll, and we have a two, which is kind of annoying. It's going to go one, two. And guys and gals, we lose our first person. We replenish a tile and we keep going. Let's get back into red. We'll take the wood producing tile there. We'll place it to the east so we can get some wood and another cow. And we get one movement point, which now I'm thinking we should use. I'm gonna move him just up here and hopefully we can continue pressing to the east. Another tile comes out. Red gets their second turn in a row, and they have got good pickings. Let's go ahead and take Pulteney, which is going to give us the ability to turn our barley into whiskey. We place the tile, immediately gaining a whiskey barrel for our own personal supply, and then we activate the tile and each of its surrounding ones. We get our third cow, our third barley, and we also have the opportunity to turn one of our barley into another whiskey barrel, which we are certainly gonna do because these suckers mean points. 
Here we are back at the rondelle. We'll place a new tile out and finally, Blue gets their turn. You see what happens when you overextend? You just cannot be that aggressive. Let's go ahead and take that other stone producing tile as planned, but I really don't think it's a good idea. We place it down and we activate it and its surrounding tiles. One, two, and we get to move our little guy. Let's get him along there, a little bit to the east. Now we have the dreaded dice. It rolls a one and Achfei is out of there, which is a shame because this would have given anyone a new Scotsman for their territory. We replenish the board and Blue gets their other turn. They should start thinking real hard about what they need to do to catch up here because this ain't good. I really think they're going to need to take Lock Locky if they're going to remain anywhere near competitive here. We place Locky along the river and in doing so gain ourselves a province card which rewards two of any resources that we would like. We'll take a wood and a cattle. We replenish and this ladies and gentlemen is our final A tile. We pause the game right here, no one gets any further activation and we have our intermediate scoring. Here we've got our current standing. The first thing we'll check for is Scotsman in the castle. No one's currently got any, so no scoring occurs there. The next thing we're going to do is check for province cards, and the blue player has one, the red player has none. That, ladies and gentlemen, is a difference of one, meaning the blue player is going to gain one victory point. There we go. The third thing to be scored are the Whiskey Barrels and Red has two against Blue zero. That is a difference of two, two victory points. Easy as. The last thing to check is Person Tiles, but currently no one has any. So that, ladies and gentlemen, concludes the intermediate scoring and gameplay continues. We return to our track. Red's in there. They want to get more victory points, so they're going to go straight for Aberfoyle. Now currently Red only have a single Scotsman, which means they're a bit limited as to where to place the new tile. It could go here or here, but not down here because it doesn't have a river. So let's go ahead and place it right smack in the middle here. It gains no immediate benefits, but we are going to activate a ton of tiles off this one. And we can do this in any order, which is really good because we have three cattle here and would not be able to produce any more. Let's go ahead and begin by activating the tile we just placed. With this, we can trade any combination of two cattle and or sheep for four victory points. We've got two cattle here, so let's go ahead, get rid of them, net ourselves four victory points in the process. Activated. Let's go to Pulteney and we'll turn one of our barley into another whiskey barrel. We'll now activate Rathaseer and we'll gain that spent barley back. To our cattle ranch, we gain a new cow. And then finally, we activate Abernathy, gaining a second wood resource. Brilliant. We go ahead and replenish the line with our first B tile and we have a wood producer. Next, we'll roll our dice for that dummy dice player and rolling a one, we get rid of Glen Moore. We replenish and then we're back to Blue's turn. And I think they're going to shoot ahead just a little bit to gain Castle Stalker. We'll place this one south of the lock, but it is going to cost us one wood, one cattle and one stone for us to place. Not only do we gain the province card and three coins as a reward, oh yeah, we gain a new Scotsman. I'm going to go ahead and place that one there, and then we can begin activating our tiles. In total, we're going to gain two points of movement and one stone. So let's put that stone out, and I'm thinking for the movement, we are going to move our Scotsman back to the castle. Not only will this allow us to score a little bit in the next intermittent scoring phase, but it allows us to extend the range at which we can build. Red's activation now, and I don't think they need another wood producer. I think though we'd really like to see the clan board in action. So we're going to place our Red Scotsman there and drop the token off in our supply. But as you can see, this has the immediate effect of allowing us to place one of our clan markers. Question is though, where do we want to go? My goodness. Well, I think I'd really like to get a couple more Scotsmen on the board 
And I think the best one for us right now, it's cheap too, is the McKinnon family there. So let's go ahead and place our marker there. It costs us zero coin, which is fantastic. And as our reward, we get to place a Scotsman and we gain two coins for our supply. Now our Scotsman, we can go ahead and place wherever we would like. And I'm thinking we're going to drop him back down into the castle. And that way we can start building south of the river. Of course, in addition to this, we gain those two coins. I love it. And the game presses on. As you can see, guys and gals, the mechanics of this game are quite simple. Gain tiles, build your engine, and try and build up your scoring abilities any chance you get. We've only really experienced the start and A side tiles, but as we move through the Bs, the Cs to the Ds, things start getting more complex and the decisions we make become a lot harder to evaluate. I mean, even the clans, figuring out what you need and when, it can be tough. But I think it's also really satisfying building and trading and working this stuff into a fully oiled machine. But guys and gals, what you've seen here right now, this is just the tip of the iceberg. Glenmore right here right now comes with a grand total of eight additional chronicles, eight ways to change this game up and experience it under a completely new light. Yes, each of them will still use these mechanics as the basis for their gameplay, but it looks like they are going to keep things fresh. Now, while I can't tell you that I've played them all yet, I can tell you that I am super excited to get into them. And what better way to express this excitement is give you guys a quick teaser of the contents of each of these chronicles. In chronicle number one, we have the dragon boat races. Here, each player, in addition to the standard setup, will each place a dragon boat and three race rewards in their home castle. Early in the B round, the start tile is going to come out, and once any player has passed that marker, the race begins for all players. From this point on, players may utilize their movement actions to move their boats clockwise around the course. Anytime a player passes another player's castle, they gain a reward looking at and choosing one of the three tokens available and then continue on. Should any player make it all the way around the circuit back to their home board, they will gain a reward card with first player gaining the first place card, second player gaining the second and third player catching um third. Now, of course, players are going to be doing whatever they can to extend the rivers on their own boards to make it harder and harder for other players to get around. So much so that if a player is unable to make their way across, they are going to take a loser's card, which nullifies any victory points gained from money at the end of the game. It's brutal. But hey, that's dragon boat racing. The second chronicle is called Highlander. There can be only one, and I love this. It basically places a mountain at the bottom of the board. This mountain turns two spaces into one. Over the course of the game, players will make their way around the rondelle, and at some point in their journey, they will reach the mountain. See, the mountain creates a kind of toll. Should a player want to skip the mountain going beyond to collect one of the tiles further up, they must pay for the privilege. That is, they must either pay a coin or a resource to the mountain. Now, players can avoid this toll by spending a turn on top of the mountain, but obviously you're not picking anything up there. The reason for doing this though, when it's time for the player to leave the mountain, they take with them all the resources that had been paid previous. It creates a sort of free parking aspect to the game. <laughs> Chronicle number three gives us old Jamie's single cask reserve. Here, the game's whiskey houses are replaced with new versions of the tiles. There's plenty as you can see. These tiles come with a new action that can be taken when the tile is activated, giving players the power to age any of their earned whiskey. You see, players each begin with a first seller, and over the course of the game, whenever a whiskey barrel is created, they can place it in the leftmost space, starting at one, going to two, and going to three. Each of these represents an amount of victory points if the player is able to sell them. 
At this point, if any further casts were created, they would be placed in the zero section of the card. Now these activations allow players to age their whiskey. So in this case, a player would be able to take their level one whiskey to level two. But what happens when we get to level three and can't go anywhere? Well, players can actually go ahead and purchase extensions for their cellar, allowing the whiskey to be aged even further from three up to eight victory points worth, and finally all the way up to 15 victory points worth with the third cellar. Hidden throughout our tiles, we have three selling tiles that allow players to take their whiskey, cashing them in for victory points. Should a player pass the selling tile, they're able to sell one barrel, but if they decide to land on it, they're allowed to sell two. The fourth chronicle is Hammer of the Scots, which adds in the Englishman and four new landmarks and their tiles. The game will play as usual, but the first person to pass the Englishman will gain the Englishman's token and then gain control of its piece. This essentially grants a second activation that can be utilized in the rondelle. Now, of course, there's going to be a catch for this second activation, and that is it's actually going to cost you coins to activate him. And this is tracked through the English track, which has been added to the marketplace. The track starts with a single coin and works just the same as any of the other market spaces. Should a player wish to activate the Englishman from here, they would need to spend two coins to activate with a further activation with a further activation costing three. Now, players, of course, don't have to activate the Englishman, and if they choose not to, they can simply take the rightmost stack of coins into their supply and then move the Englishman as if he were the dice. You would move him to a chosen tile and discard the tile. Now, this is a very powerful ability, but the good news is the Englishman is likely going to change hands throughout the game, and that any time a player takes one of the new landmarks, the English token travels with it. The fifth chronicle, addressed to a haggis, adds in eight new tiles where players can turn sheep resources into haggis. So each player as a part of setup will gain the haggis table, which contains spaces for five haggis tokens, of which there are 13 in the general supply. Two of these will be kept face up at any given time. And then from now on, should a player ever produce haggis from one of their tiles, they may choose to take a haggis token from the face down or face up pile, adding it to their table. The values in this pile go from one to three. Haggis tokens received should be placed face down on the player's table cut left there until the haggis is scoring round, which occurs at the end of the B phase, the C phase, and the D phase. It's in this round that players will roll the dice four times, with every rolled result allowing the player to flip over one of their haggis tokens if they have a matching number. So here we roll, we get a two, we'll flip over one of our number two haggis. Now, over the course of the four rolls, players will be able to turn over at most three of their haggis. And then to finish off the scoring round, players will earn victory points based on the numbers shown and the number of haggis actually flipped. So in this case, our player would earn six points, the sum of the values shown, times three, the number of tokens actually flipped. 18 points. At the end of the scoring, face-up haggis is removed from the table with face-down tokens remaining in place for the next scoring phase. The dubious tome of Scottish history adds new tiles and landmark events to be played with the game. Now, landmarks sort of work the same way. When they are taken, they still grant an immediate effect. However, if a player is to activate an event symbol on a tile they've taken, they are then able to flip over their landmark card to its event side. Now, landmark cards are still scored as normal, except they grant one additional victory point for each one showing the event side face up, with some events offering new ways to score intermediate scoring throughout the course of the game. The seventh chronicle, between a rock and a hard place, adds new scoring opportunities for endgame. During setup, five out of ten possible new scoring cards are drawn and set aside next to the rondelle. As the game continues, anytime a person tile is taken from the rondelle, a vote is called, with the player who took the person choosing one of the five scoring tiles to vote on. 
It's here players will utilize their I and Nay vote tokens to determine whether the proposed scoring will actually enter the end game. If there are more I's than Nay's, the scoring goes in. The final chronicle in the base game is the Penny Mobs, which introduces a small deck of Penny Mobsters, a portion of which will be included throughout the game. At the end of every turn, players will have the opportunity to pay the Penny Mobsters or take them into their supply. But why would they go ahead and do that? Well, every player is actually going to start with seven negative one victory points tokens, which can be flipped to a positive side should a player choose to donate their hard earned coins to the Penny Mobs. Now there is a small push your luck element here because every time a Penny Mobster receives a coin, they become more valuable because the other option is to instead of pay them coins, take the card into your supply, gaining not only the coins on it, but the Mobster's special ability as well. Now there are nine mobsters that can be used in the base game, but there's also a handful more that can be utilized in some of the game's other chronicles, even further pushing this thing out. Now, truth be told, there is one final chronicle floating around, What Lurks Beneath. This is a Kickstarter exclusive chronicle featuring old pal Nessie. Love it. Now this one has Nessie set up along the edge of the blank space behind our players, and it acts as sort of a Monopoly's go. Should a player ever pass Nessie before taking their chosen tile in hand, they have to draw and resolve completely one of Nessie's cards. Now these effects are pretty wild, most of which granting victory points, but all of which thoroughly entertaining. For example, this card here allows us to move Scotsmen in our territory, moving them to a landmark, and we're going to gain one victory point for every Scotsman move this way, or two victory points if we're moving them to a lock. Here, we get to rearrange all the tiles ahead of the foremost player, and gain three victory points for doing so. These things, honestly, are wild, and there is a lovely deck full of them. I cannot speak for its balance, but far out, it is a fun addition. <laughs> and that's it, guys and gals. What a massive game in the box there. Far out. They've done so much tweaking and so much expansion. Fun Tales have really done their bit, breathing fresh life into this game. That'll do for the gameplay side of things. I think you guys have seen enough, so let's head on back to the studio and have a chat about what this game might mean for your game night. It's a little bit hard to hide, but I'm pretty excited about it. So yeah, let's go ahead and get into all that. <laughs> Guys and gals, there we have it. Glenmore absolutely bursting at the seams with replayability and content thanks to those expansions. Now, of course, supporting it all, we have a fantastic base game, and that's what we're going to be talking about mostly here. So, um, I guess if you've seen the video, you know exactly what's going on there. This game is dead simple to play, dead simple to teach, but it offers a surprising amount of depth in its strategy going throughout. Yes, all players are trying to achieve the same thing, but how do they manage to do so? That is completely up to them. Now, even just the base game, I believe replayability is pretty solid. You are going to be running through the same phases of gameplay without change. There's always the A phase, which contains these tiles. There's always the B phase, the C phase, the D phase. They've always got the same tiles in them. So eventually, after enough plays, you might see yourself doing the same things throughout the different phases. But because of that shared rondelle, there is so much player interaction going on in that players are always going to steal the thing that you want before you get a chance to get to them. So it's not entirely player interaction, but your strategies will depend very much on what the other player does with their turn. It's certainly not a lightweight game and I would thrust it heavily into that medium weight category, but like I said before, this is a game that anyone can grasp onto. They may not be competitive, but they're sure as hell going to have a lot of fun, especially because you get to build up your own territory. You get to place the little pieces on the territory. And I know a lot of people out there would have fun doing just that. The expansions, these chronicles, guys and gals, add so much depth, so much replayability that I've only managed to dip a toe into them. 
what they do is subtly change the overall feel of the game. Yes, you're still going to be shooting out to achieve the standard victory conditions, but then there is this one or two extra things that you have to be aware of. And the balancing act between all these victory conditions, it shifts and it changes, and it just it changes the way that you think and play in the game. Now, obviously, with the expansions, I can only say how excited I am to experience them, but I'm going to be getting into them much later. There is so much content here for me to work through that I can see this game lasting a hell of a long time. Is it a forever game for me? Well, if Fun Tales continue to support it with the love and passion they've shown in its rebirth as Glenmore 2, then hells yes. That'll do for my prattling on here today. Um, if you've enjoyed the video, uh, make sure you like, comment, subscribe, do all the things that you guys can do to help this channel grow. But if you want any more depth on those chronicles, let me know and I'll try and sneak in a couple of extra plays to try and understand them more so I can answer your questions and maybe show and highlight some of the things I might have missed in my brief overviews there. Again, thanks for watching and as always, my name's Michael, this is Bits Aboard, we'll catch you next time.